a hush falls over the assembly. Ah, that's better. Right, are we ready for me to start? Can you hear me? Can you see the screen? Even if you're right at the side. Yep, fair enough. Um, well, I'm Hugh Jones, as you probably know, some of you. But uh, this is not a formal lecture this evening, but I've got such a wonderful collection of photographs of my fossil collection that I think it's nice to share a bit now and then and let other people enjoy them as well. So I brought along just a small selection of photographs. And I shall say a little bit about them, um, but I won't lecture you about them, hopefully. Just see how we go. So this first one you'll all recognize, of course, straight away is an ammonite. It's a pyritized ammonite from the Oxford clay. And you can see the pyrites color in the middle there. Um, pyrites fossils are a bit dodgy because they tend to disintegrate after a time. Um, but that one has survived about 60 years, so it's not doing too badly. That's after the first 100, 180 million years as it survived in the ground, of course. Um, but right, let's move up slowly on, um, find the projectors. There we are. This, um, this is an ammonite sawn in half. I didn't do it instead. I bought this one, I have to confess. But you can see the chambers that it's made up of. Actually, I might as well use this pointer that I've been provided with. Um, and the, these chambers here look a bit dark. They would obviously have been empty when it was first fossilized. Um, they're filled with crystals since. These are filled with sediment. I don't know how the sediment got into these, but anyway, that's the pattern. You can see a typical ammonite growth getting bigger and bigger as it goes around. And the, what the animal did, it lived in the open chamber at the end. And it was a thing a little bit like an octopus, really, to the uninitiated. So it sat in there and it could withdraw into its end chamber uh, if it felt the need for whatever reason. The other chambers were um, but like I've been unable to decide whether they were actually empty or whether they were filled with fresh um, water of some sort, but um, they were not filled by the animal itself. Um, and uh, they make quite interesting ornaments. You see, must have seen lots of them. Uh, those scepter which we saw, the scepter are the partitions which divide the chambers. Oh, God, sorry. <laughs> must have held my finger down on it for too long, must I? Um, there we are. The, these, are the, these are the scepter. And where the scepter meet the outside case of the animal, um, they form a very complicated pattern, which is a little bit like the fan vaulting that you get in, in big churches and cathedrals. You see it in, um, in the St. Mary's in Warwick in the chancel, where the um, supports for the ceiling, or the roof rather, go up and spread out at the, at the top. They're quite difficult to visualize, but if you look at this picture, this is an ammonite where it's just broken the other way. And you can see this is the septum seen end on, where the various convolutions of the septum are visible. And where they touch the outside part forms what we call the suture around the outside. So um, I don't want to lecture for any length of time on these, but if you get interested, you can always look them up on, on uh, Google. They have good sections on ammonites and everything else. This is another ammonite, similar to the other one, but I'm always a bit intrigued by this one because I suspect that the animal, that was the open chamber that the animal lived in, and the other chambers back here were quite probably gas-filled or air-filled, one or the other, and I suspect, it's pure fiction, but I suspect that this ammonite, which had been swimming freely in the ocean, when it died, it sank to the bottom. And of course, the pressure would have increased as it went down and the empty chambers would have imploded, like if you drop a can of beans into the sea. Um, eventually it would collapse. Quite interesting speculation, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but who cares really? <laughs> the other thing that most of you will never have seen, these are what's called aptici. Um, a lot, many ammonites had little trap doors that they could close the front of the um, end chamber with. Um, they, these are fossils that I picked up again in the Oxford clay. Um, whether the, there's some controversy as far as I can say, whether they were actually part of a feeding mechanism or whether they were just to keep intruders out 
when they retired into their chamber and shut the door. So um, I don't know. But anyway, that's what they are. They come in pairs and they shut like that, like cupboard doors, really. I don't suppose you've ever seen those before, unless you've explored the right places. You could, they could pass notice. Um, this is a fossil, uh, you may, some of you have been to my talk before, you'll have seen this picture. It's the ammonite in the wall, one of the ammonites in the wall at Shipston on Stour. Uh, it's in the, it's in the, it's in the um, Lias limestone. And this is an ammonite cut across. So they're coiled that way, but if you cut it across that way, then you get this appearance. So you can see the different whirls of the being coiled up in this direction. And you can see they're getting smaller as you go towards the middle. Um, and you can, again, on that bit, you can see the convoluted nature of the um, septum uh, in that ammonite. It's quite a big ammonite, that one, incidentally. Um, but, you know, ammonites apparently can get up to six or eight feet in diameter. I'm five foot nine, so they could be huge. And they were all floating around in the open sea because the gas filled chambers gave them buoyancy. And the sea, the, the implication from the people who know about these things is that they were swarming in the sea, masses of them, a bit like jellyfish, I suppose, that you can get huge numbers from time to time. Listen, if you have any questions, do shout out. I'll wrap it on otherwise. Um, these are a couple more. This is an ammonite. That is a gastropod or snail. And the, they look very similar. But for those, if you look really closely, the point about an ammonite is that the coiling is all in a single plane. If you know what I mean? Whereas in the gastropod, the coil is a spiral. It's not very obviously spiral in that case, but it is a slightly spiral, and that means it's not an ammonite, it's a gastropod. And the other thing is, of course, this one has chambers in it, that one doesn't. The gastropod is just a single tube. A gastropod is just a snail by another name. This is a, a whelk, which I sawed in half. Um, and one of the common fossils where I grew up in North, well, North End of Buckinghamshire um, were these gastropod fossils. And what they are is simply a, a cast of the inside of a, a gastropod where the sediment got into the space in the gastropod and subsequently set. And normally what happened then is that the shell itself dissolved away over millions of years, and you're left with just that um, mold of where the animal itself lived inside the chamber. Well, the beautiful things, aren't they, Hank, when you see them like that? Like, that's a dog whelk. These little chaps are the oldest fossil, well, I say oldest, they've been in my collection for the longest, let's put it that way, because they're all ancient, but these are Silurian brachiopods. It doesn't say brachiopods, does it? No, but they are Silurian brachiopods, which I, this is where I started my geological interest. I went on a cub camp when I was at school and we went to Wenlock Edge and the, the geography master, who was the, also the cub master, he was interested in fossils and he took us on a fossil hunt up on Wenlock Edge and we were turning out hundreds of these little beggars um, out of the side of a lane. Eventually he had to stop us because the lane was going to collapse if we'd carried on because there were so many of these things being dug out. But they're nice little fossils. You can see there's one different sort here. That's a spirifer for those who like to know. These are atropers, or they were when I was at university. They've probably got a new name now. That's the trouble. Um, interesting thing about brachiopods, or one, there are lots of interesting things about them really, but there's, there are still living brachiopods, but these ones are from the Silurian, so they're about 300 million years old. I always say that was older than my dad, but now it's just because being older than me. Um, they think that there is, well, the distinguishing feature, one of the distinguishing features about brachiopods is that they are, the shells are held together by um, a ligament, which doesn't need to what that is, held together by a ligament and muscles. And when they die, they just stay like that. If you take the alternative animal, which is a bivalve, 
muscle, that's the um, ordinary seashells, they are held together by muscles, but they've also got a little bit of what almost like rubber in the hinge that holds them. So when they die, they spring apart. And so you usually find them as single cells, single shells, whereas the brachiopods you typically find as closed shells. Um, it's, it's a subtle distinction, but um, it makes it much easier to distinguish whether you're looking at a bivalve or a brachiopod. And that's a typical Jurassic brachiopod. Um, this hole at the end here, they had a tube coming out of the end there, which anchored them to the rock. Same as a muscle does these days. You know, muscles are attached by a thing called a byssus, which holds them onto the rock. Well, these were the same. They lived, they'd be living that way with the byssus going downwards and the, this open part pointing upwards. And it, it opened along this line here and they, filled, they were filter feeders. Um, they had little gills inside which caused currents to flow and the tiny particles, small creatures in the seawater would finish up in their gullet. They're quite um, sophisticated in a way. Don't expect a long talk about these things because I haven't got time. <laughs> Here's this, the other distinction. In the brachiopods, that's the brachiopods, sorry. In the brachiopods, the symmetry puts them in two halves that way around. In bivalves, their symmetry is the other way around. So if you find one that's looking asymmetrical, it's almost certainly a bivalve. Whereas if it's symmetrical, it's probably a brachiopod. Um, takes a bit of practice to recognize the difference, but if you've done as much fossil hunting as I did in my younger days, you recognize them. We're moving on. These are sea urchins, echinoderms as they're called. That is a modern one, which I picked up on the beach in Pembrokeshire. And this is a Cretaceous one, which is 150 million years old, probably. Well, anywhere from 60 to 150 million years old. The characteristic of the echinoderms, most of them, they come in two sorts. There's the irregular ones, which are bilaterally symmetrical. And there are the regular ones, which are radially symmetrical, uh, circular. And they all have one characteristic in common, they, they have these five radiating lines on them, which are lined with what's called tube feet, and um, gives them rather a distinctive appearance. They're called heart urchins for obvious reasons. Um, won't talk too much about them, but on this more modern one, you can see these holes here, which are the holes that put fluid, liquid, into the tube feet, which are little no, they're literally two feet. They're little tubes with suckers on the end, and the whole creature had those suckers on it. Starfish have the same thing, um, tube feet that they can hold on to things with. These ones, incidentally, live in the sand. They burrow. The modern heart urchin. The, the, the Cretaceous ones, I suspect, lived on the surface because their shell or test is rather thicker than that of the modern. These are very fragile, um, just thin of an eggshell, really. They break terribly easily. But we have to deduce what their lifestyle would be. And my only comment on that is I did see a program which was pointing out that creatures that live on rocky shores, where, there's a rough, where it can be a bit rough, um, tend to have thicker shells than the ones that live in more sheltered places. It was particularly noticeable where they were talking about periwinkles and whelks, but um, I'm sure the same thing must apply to the sea urchins. This is a regular urchin, not quite such a good photograph, but you can see it's circular and it's got one, two, three, four, five of these radi <coughs> radiating um, ambulacra, given that correct term. Well, life's full of long names, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> they're called ambulacra, and um, the other thing about this is you can see it's covered with little nobbles give them a proper name, they're called tubercles. And in life, all those tubercles would have <coughs> spines sticking out from them like this. So the whole thing is a bit like a aquatic hedgehog. Um, these are some of the spines of 
a sea urchin. The sea urchins are made up of plates of calcite like that, the tubercles in the middle. And these things, you can see, have got a, a little cup shape in the end, which fits over the tubercle like that. And then there are muscles around the outside, which allow it to waggle its um, spines like that. One of the really intriguing things about echinoderms is that these plates, and allegedly the spines, each one is made up of a single crystal of calcite. How it gets into that shape is a bit of a puzzle when you think what crystals are like, but anyway, that if you break them, they do have a crystal cleavage across them. And these are these spines. Um, that, if that is true, I really find it very hard to understand how you can get a change like that a little way along the length of the spine. I've not found a satisfactory explanation for that, but um, that's what happens. I've got hundreds of them, well, not quite, dozens, and they all have this same change part way along. I think they're beautiful things, but um, one of my favorite fossils, really. This is a, another sea urchin, an echinus, echinochorus is its proper name, and you can see here, for example, the great the thickness of the wall of the animal. What intrigues me here is that one. I, I don't know if you ever thought about it, but if you go into a, um, a museum, like the Museum of uh, Motor Cars at Gaiden or somewhere, if there's a car that is all smashed up, that's the one that holds your attention because you wonder what happened to it. All the ones that look all smart and shiny and straight off the, off the uh, production line, they're, they're just, they're nice, but they've they got no real interest. Now, here, that little beggar there is the same as this one, but what happened to it in the deep chalk sea? If it was sitting on the bottom of the chalk sea, and it obviously had to sit on the bottom, it's too heavy. Um, if it sat down there, what could have crushed it like that? You might say water pressure, but no, that can't happen because it's got a hole in it. There's an opening in the mouth and the anus. Pressure would equalize. Somebody walked on it. You don't walk around on the bottom of a chalk sea. So what happened to it? I thought about this a lot, and my only conclusion is that somebody with a big mouth came along and bit it and didn't fancy it. Um, it presumably that was the bite mark on it. But it's again, it's speculation, but that's what life's all about in geology. You, know, you have to speculate on what's, what you're looking at. So very thick shells on those, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, you were just scratching, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Here's something you've probably never seen. It's what's called a numulite. Um, I worked in the BP in North Africa, in Libya for a, a couple of years, and these were very common in the um, hills along the coast. I imagine they're equally common on the Mediterranean coast too, because the, the north, you know, the um, French coast and the Greek coast, but I've not been there. So um, numulites are amazing creatures. They're about the size of a two pence piece. It can be smaller, some are a little bit larger, but that's the average sort of size. That's a paper clip, just the best I could manage at the time. And the extraordinary thing about them, I don't know whether you did enough biology at school, you probably started with the amoeba, if you did, as a single celled animal. Well, this is also a single celled animal, but compare the size of that with the size of an amoeba, and it makes you think a bit. Um, I've often wondered how they managed it. And if you see this picture, which is a bit of nominated limestone scene, you can see it's just about see it's masses and masses of little tiny chambers. Um, it, it grew rather like an ammonite. It grew by spiraling on. And at the same time, it grew a case on the outside. So hard to visualize really, but they're rather beautiful and wonderful little objects to find. But you don't find them in this country. I don't think we've got anywhere in this country. Correct me if anybody knows me that to be incorrect. But as far as I know, you can't find numulites in Britain. Um, you have to go to North Africa or somewhere to pick them up. Where they were, the pyramids apparently are made of numulitic limestone, which is what that is. 
I think we've got one more slide before I yield. No, no, a couple more. Um, you'll all recognize that immediately as a, a trilobite. And um, these are ancient. The bit I want you to look at particularly is that bit, what we call the cephalon or the head shield. And it has these compound eyes, which are the same sort of eyes that you get on insects, dragonflies and the like. And you can see this chap looking at you out of a piece of Silurian limestone um, with these compound eyes. And what intrigues me here, these, as far to the best of my knowledge, are the first creatures that would have been able to picture the world around them to any degree. They have a pretty crude picture, but because um, each of these little dots, just let me put the next picture in, you'll see it. Each of those little spots is like a tiny telescope. So it's like a whole load of telescopes sticking out from the center point, which is famous that insects have today. And it would, the picture it would produce for the animal would obviously be a sort of um, mosaic type picture. But even so, it was probably adequate to see something moving in the vicinity. What they really saw, we, we will never know because they've been extinct for 200 million years or more. Um, but rather remarkable little creatures. Uh, Incidentally, um, trilobites can reach about eight or nine inches in length. I don't think they get much bigger than that, but um, that's the sort of biggest I've seen. If you want to see a really good fossil collection, go to the Sedgwick Museum in Cambridge. Sorry, there was a voice. <laughs> I think, yes, this is the last picture of mine. Um, this is something that you will not often see. It's a bit of what's called the coralline crag from East Anglia. Um, it's a pretty recent sediment. Um, I wonder, can we zoom on this um, system, do you know, Jim? Uh, I wonder. Yeah. Um, Hang on, I'll see what I can do with that. Oh, that zoomed, didn't it? Oh, that's a bit better. Uh, yes, it's, there are things called bryozoa or polyzoa, whichever name you choose, and they're colonial things. Each of those little, each aperture is a little tiny polyp thing. If we did enough biology at school, you'd know what hydra is, well, each of those is like a little hydra sticking out of the hole. And they're similar to corals, um, but they're actually rather more sophisticated than corals in some ways, because a coral, I only learned this the other day, uh, and well, I knew the corals, corals are just like hydra, they're, they're just, the body is just a sack. They've got tentacles at the top, and the, in the middle is a mouth, and below there, there's a sack. And when they feed, the tentacles grab the food, push it into the sack, goes down into the sack, it gets digested by enzymes, and then it's shot out again through the same way that it went in, the debris. These things are a little bit more sophisticated. They have the same tentacles, they have a mouth in the middle, they push the food down, but they also have a separate aperture, an anus, through which they eject the um, residue. So that in that sense, they're slightly more complicated and a little bit more sophisticated than the corals, but it's a rather beautiful deposit. You don't find it very often. I think there's not an awful lot of it to be found, which means they don't really, I suspect, encourage people by and large to take samples of it. Otherwise, it would all disappear in a very short time. Um, I think that's my last picture on these. I hope I haven't. No, here we are. we're back to the starting point. So there you are. That's uh, I've got a, a, a pretty extensive collection of small fossils of my own, which I collected. I haven't collected any for years, but when I was younger, I used to scour around pits and quarries, and I was lucky enough to work in a chalk area. When I was young, there wasn't any restriction on getting into the clay pits and things like that. You know, you could just wander in, as long as you didn't get in the way of the machinery, nobody minded. Um, so you, they were brilliant places for collecting fossils. Um, Gwenlock Edge was open, you could go in and fossil under the quarries there, which are now shut off. It's all gone. And nearly, when I, nearly all the quarries that I found my little um, gastropods in, they've all been filled in with rubbish and grassed over now. So, 
the scope for a young geologist trying to build up a fossil collection is now fairly limited. But say, I'm not a young geologist, so I, I had quite a lot. Any questions?